All right, so today we're going to start chapter 13, and we're going to take a look at some of the things we're going to take a look at today you have seen before. Um, maybe not done in the exact same way, but you have actually seen portions of today's lesson before. That's something new in this class, right? Most of the stuff that you've seen in this class is not something you've seen in other math classes before, but a portion at least of what we do today you will have. Um, and then we're going to move into more aspects of financial mathematics as we move through chapter 13, most of which you probably haven't seen, at least not in a math classroom before. Okay, You may have seen aspects of them in other real-life contexts, um, but maybe not in, in classroom. All right, so the first thing we're going to take a look at today is the time value of money. And <clears throat> the first concept is simple interest. And this one you may or may not have seen. You've probably seen the formula. You may not have seen it written this way, but um, simple interest is simply this. You find simple interest, which we'll call I, by taking the principal P times the interest rate R as a decimal and multiplying it by T, which is time. So, does anybody remember what principle is? It's your starting amount. Either there's, there's two different ways we can talk about simple interest or any of the interests we're going to be working with. You can either talk about putting the money into an account you know, like your savings account at the bank, something like that. Or you can talk about taking a loan out of a certain amount. In either case, the initial amount that you either put in or borrow is called the principal. Okay? So this works either direction. The R that you need to remember is that the interest rate is as a decimal. That's really important because if you put that in there as a whole number, like 7% and you put in 7 you're going to find that there, you, you accrued a lot of interest, or maybe you paid a lot of interest, way more than you should have, okay? So you've got to make sure you change it into a decimal value. <clears throat> and then the last piece is that the time is measured in years. So occasionally, especially in your book, it will tell you something like that you're borrowing the money for 18 months. Or you often will see car loans written for a certain number of months, right? They aren't always telling you, oh, it's for four years. They'll say for 48 months. I don't know why they like to do that, but they do. We have to turn it into years to use this formula. Okay? We're all good with that? All right, there's another formula that you're going to use. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is the future value for simple interest. And you can be done in one of two ways. I'm going to show you one formula for it, and then I'll show you the other and show you how they're related. Um, you still take A is the amount you have after how many years. So it's the amount that you paid for that car after you paid all the interest or the amount that's in the account after you left it there for a certain length of time. It's the, it's the value at the end. So if P is the value at the beginning, the A is the value at the end. Okay? Um, and you take the value and put in parentheses 1 plus RT. Now the other formula for this looks like this. So from a formula perspective, can you tell me how these are related? Yeah, you just distribute the P, right? You just distribute through the, the parentheses. It's no big deal. Um, now, from a perspective of the concept of what's going on, P is the principal. It's the amount of money you put in to the account or the amount of what you borrowed. And this is the interest, right? So if you take the amount that you borrowed plus the interest, that's the total amount at the end. Does that make sense? So it depends on what you're trying to find or what you're working with as to maybe which of the two formulas, although they're, of course, very related, that you want to use at any particular time. Can you put that away for me, Mason, please? Thank you. All right, so we're going to do some questions with these, and you can see how you might want to use which formula in which case. Um, <clears throat> At some point, we're going to do some problems that are not simple interest, okay? At some point in the very near future, in fact, today. So when you're looking at these, you need to be marking for yourself sort of the ideas of what's going on so that you know which formula to use. And you're going to be doing this throughout Chapter 13, okay? But chapter 13 is not a difficult chapter, but some people struggled with it last semester in particular because they couldn't figure out which different formula to use. And the reality is that the problem usually tells you. Okay, so you just have to actually learn to read the problem carefully, and you'll be able to find the piece of information you're looking for. Okay, all right, so taking a look at this one, it says Paul is owed $530 by the IRS. Apparently he paid too much money on his taxes. You guys wouldn't do that, would you? 
All right, so this is for overpayment of last year's taxes. The IRS will, rep will repay the amount at 4% simple interest. So we know he's getting the 530 back because that's what they owe him, but they're going to give him a little bit extra because they hung on to his money too long. I don't think the IRS really does this, just so you know. This is from your book. I did not create this particular one. All right, so we're going to figure out how much the IRS actually owes Paul. And it actually asks on this piece right here first for the amount of interest, okay? That's really important because that tells you which formula to use. I've already given you three formulas. Two of them are related. One of them is related, but it's a different formula. Which of these three formulas are we asked to use on part A? Yeah, the first one, because it asked for the interest, right? Okay. So we're going to start with I equals PRT. What's P? That's the 530. It's the initial amount, right? Whatever it started out as. What is R? Okay, so R is the interest rate turned into a decimal, and that would be 0 0.04. You might remember from somewhere in mathematics, somebody told you that you put things into decimal form from a percent form by moving the decimal place how? Two to the left. Yeah? So if we had four, the decimal would have originally been over here, and we moved it two to the left, making it 0 0.04. Okay. All right, so there's my interest rate. And then the T is for the amount of time. So what would be the amount of time on this one? One year. It says it was on his last year's return, so we're assuming the one year is what they're referring to. And again, we put it in as the amount of years. Okay. All right, so grab your calculator, which you know you're going to need for the rest of the semester. If you don't have it with you, just watch as we're doing it and make sure you bring it next time. What is 530 times 0 .01, I'm sorry, 0 .04 and then times 1? 2120, right? And the is a, uh, currency. Yes, it is, because this is the amount of money. So we definitely make sure we want to have our dollar sign on there. Okay, everybody good so far? Okay. The next question can be done in a couple of ways. So let's take a look at it. Part B says find the total amount that the IRS owes Paul. So somebody suggests one way you could do this problem. Matthew. Add, add the, uh, Okay, so we could add the 530 plus the 2120. And if we do that, we have actually are using one of the formulas, although you don't see it exactly here. You're using that second formula, right? Where it's P plus PRT. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, you're using it. You just don't see it within what you're doing. But that's the formula that's being used, right? So here's the initial amount that you told, you told me, right, Matt? And then this piece right here was the interest amount that we calculated on part A. And that's the 2120. Okay, so how much money is the total? 5120. And again, just like Tyler mentioned, make sure you've got your dollar sign on there. Okay, now let's assume that we had not done part A. How else could we do this problem besides simply adding the 2120, which we had to find on part A, to this particular $530? Well, we could go back and we could actually use this same formula that we mentioned right here, right? We could use that formula and plug in all the pieces. Or we could actually use the other formula. Do you guys remember that one? <coughs> the one that has the parentheses here? So if we use that formula, this, the first one in that particular set, we would take the principal P, 1 plus RT, and we'd put our values in this way. So what was my principal P? 530. What was my interest rate R? 0. 0.04. And my time was one year. Okay, so that one's not going to affect a whole lot. But if you take a look down here, I'll simplify before I let you put the calculator to play here. But this is actually 0.04 times 1. You've got to remember order of operations here. This is multiplication first. So you're going to multiply those two, and then you're going to add the one to it. Well, multiplying these two just keeps the 0.04 the same. And then we're adding the one, so this is 1.04. So your calculator really only needs to do the operation 530 times 1.04. And... Does it give you the same value? Yes, better, right? Yeah, it does. 
So it doesn't matter which formula you use, and it doesn't matter whether or not we had the interest to start with. If we did, the problem was really easy, right, Matt? We just added two pieces together, not, not so bad. But even if that isn't the case, this is not hard either. This is multiplication and addition, and you guys could do this in about fourth grade, right? Now, we're about to complicate with context, which is the overlay on this that makes this more challenging, but the computations themselves are not. Are you guys tracking with me on that? Okay. All right, so we are going to change now gears. Instead of talking about simple interest, we're going to talk about compound interest. And I know you've seen this before, too. I know you've seen this one. You may not have seen simple interest or at least have not thought about it quite that way, but you've seen compound interest because you saw it in an algebra course somewhere. Okay, so compound interest is interest that compounds with regularity. Something like annually, semi-annually, quarterly, weekly, monthly, daily, etc. Okay, it recurrently compounds. Now what you don't have on this one is you don't have an I equals formula. Okay, there's not an interest equals something formula. You can find the interest, but there isn't a direct formula that your book gives you for finding it. But it does give you a value, or a formula for finding the value of the future value of the, of the money. Okay, so that A equals formula will exist here. <clears throat> and I'm having a difficulty remembering whether or not your book uses this same formula because one of the books I teach with uses it and another one doesn't. Um, the formula that I am using, if it doesn't match your book, go with this one because this is very traditional, what you see in most textbooks and the one you've probably seen used before. What it does is it takes the principal, just like the last formula, and it has those parentheses just like the last formula. What's different is what goes inside the parentheses. You've still got the one plus, that's part's the same. What's different is that you have R over N, and on the outside you have NT as an exponent. Those pieces are all different than that last formula, right? Now let's talk about what all those pieces are. Yes, Matt? Is that NT or RT? It is NT as an exponent. NT. Okay, all of these letters are the same as they were on the previous slide. P is your principal, the amount of money you either borrowed or you invested. R is your interest rate as a decimal. Okay? T is your time in years. All those are all the same. The only new letter in this calculation is this letter N, and N is the number of compoundings. Now, that's what was described in parentheses above, where it said annually, semi-annually, quarterly, monthly, weekly, daily, etc. So you have to actually be able to process how many times a year that means. For instance, if something says it's done annually, what does that mean? Once, Once a year, right? The annual Christmas banquet. It's a one-time-a-year event. What does semi-annually mean for those of you who like to shop? Twice a year, right? A semi-annual sale, yeah? Twice a year. How about quarterly? Four. Quarter means four. It doesn't mean 25 cents. It really doesn't. It really means a quarter, like four, four times. So when we talk about a quarter of an hour, that's why it's 15 minutes and not 25. Common misconception for kids, by the way, for those of you who are going to be teachers. Quarter does not mean 25. It means four times. All right, monthly would then be? 12, because there's 12 months a year. What about weekly? 52. Daily? We're going to go with 365. <laughs> the traditional way of approaching it is to do 365. We're not going to worry about that extra quarter of a day every fourth year business, no. We're just going to go 365, okay? Um, there's other things that you might see, but these are the ones you see mostly, okay? These are the ones. So the N is going to be whatever that value is. <clears throat> now, a couple of words of advice when you're looking at this as we start working problems. Uh, most of your calculators will be able to deal with this just fine, but you do have to use some caution. In particular, this exponent right here has multiplication in it. Okay? So when you're using your calculator to do these, I strongly recommend you just multiply that exponent and use that multiplied factor, that value after it's been multiplied in your calculation. If you don't, at some point you're going to do something funny and your calculator is going to think that you want to do the exponent first, which means it's going to raise it to the power of n first, and then it's going to multiply by the p afterwards. It's going to go with order of operations. 
most of your calculators will do that to you, which is not helpful because it's going to give you a wrong answer. So the easiest way to fix that, regardless of what calculator you're using, is to simply multiply that exponent together first before you get involved with the calculator. Okay? That's the most common mistake. Um, occasionally something will happen inside the parentheses, but that's usually not the problem. It's usually the exponent that causes the problem. All right, so let's take a look. <clears throat> you have one with some pieces of a table filled in. It says find the amount, that is the future value, and interest earned for the following. So you see we have a principal of $7,500. The interest rate is 3.5%. It's compounded semi-annually. The time is 25 years. Okay, so that's all of the given information. It starts out that way. And they ask you for two values. They ask you for the final amount. That's good because that's actually what your formula gives you, right, is the final amount. And then it asks you for the compounded interest, and I'll show you how we find that if you haven't already sort of thought through that at this point. Okay, so, but this is the one that our formula gives us is the final amount. So we're going to take our formula from the previous page, which started out as A equals. A equals what? The principal, which is 7,500 here. Next thing that happens is you have a parenthesis, and inside the parenthesis you have 1 plus. That never changes. What goes in the exponent, or goes in the numerator of this fraction that comes next? Right, it's the interest rate. Here the interest rate is 3.5%, which is 0 0.035. What's the denominator? Two. two. It's the number of compoundings per year. It's two. That's it, and that's it for inside my parenthesis. Now I have an exponent. The exponent has an n and a t. What was n? Two. Two in this problem, right? And what is t? Twenty-five. It's the number of years. Twenty-five. <coughs> Okay, so this is where I advise you to do this. I advise you to actually multiply the 2 and the 25 together before you do anything else. Everything else, if you want to let your calculator do it, you're more than welcome to do that. But you, somebody's going to make a mistake if you don't actually simplify that exponent first. So what is 2 times 25? 50, and it was really painless to do that, right? Not a problem. All right, now you might decide to go ahead and simplify this piece in here, and it will simplify pretty nicely on this particular one with no repeating decimals or anything like that. This one's going to be really nice. If you had gotten an ugly decimal in here, something that goes on, it continues or whatever, you need to make sure you keep the ugly decimal for the entire calculation. Don't round anything until the very end, okay? Rounding too soon is problem number one, problem number two. I already told you problem number one is the exponent. Problem number two or error number two at these is rounding too soon. So what is, and again, you would divide first. So take 0 0.035, divide by two in your calculator, hit enter, and then add the one. What is that value that's currently inside that parenthesis? I don't have it written down, so somebody's going to tell me. Like that, Mackenzie? Excellent. Okay, now if you've got a calculator, Mackenzie, hold your calculator up. Besides the fact that it's a beautiful orange color, some of you have calculators like this. They're not as pretty. Like Brian's. It's gray. <laughs> I know. Mine's black. So not as pretty. But they have that feature where you can actually put a string of things in and you can actually type it in to look exactly like this. Okay? If you don't have a calculator like that, you have one that looks more like, where, who's the scientific one? Not the iPhone one, but like, yeah, we'll show that one, Marquez. Okay, if you have one that looks more like Marquez's, you have to do a little bit more entry work. You can't enter it exactly like this. So if you have a scientific one like Quez has, you're going to do this part with the exponent first. So you're going to put in the 1.0175, and then you're going to hit a caret key or an X to the Y key and tell it 50 is your exponent and hit enter, okay? And then you're going to hit multiply by 7,500. You have to do the order of operations yourself if you're dealing with a scientific calculator, most of them, okay? Now, if you have the other kind that we were talking about that McKinsey and Brian have, and many of you have those too, it will do the order of operations for you, which means you can enter it almost identically to what I have here, but you will have one other button that you will push, and the button when you push it will actually put in a character that looks like this. This is a carrot, okay? You got it on the keyboard of a, of a computer screen, too. That will give you that exponent value. And you hit enter, okay? So either way, you're going to get this value, and you're going to get a value of what? What do you guys get? I got a dollar sign here. What else? Eight. 
855. Does it have change? Two decimals? Okay, so 916 would mean 92, right? If we round to two decimal places because we're dealing with money. This number right here is the final amount. It goes in that spot right there. Because so the final amount, so if you went today and you had an account that paid you 3.5%, it was compounded semi-annually, and you left it there for 25 years, and you invested $7,500, and you came back 25 years from today, the account would now have in it $17,855.92. Okay, does that make sense? So the second question is then, how much interest did that make? How would you find out? Uh huh. So, how about we take this final amount, and what could we do, Alice? Do you know, Mason? Sure. This is the total amount we have when we come back in twenty-five years, right? So this is the amount that it is now, twenty-five years later, and this is the amount that it originally was over here. So this is the amount that I put in. This is the amount that I can now take out. Everything that changed in that time frame was interest. So we can simply take the $17,855.92 and subtract off the $7,500, and that will be the amount that it grew if we didn't touch it, which is the assumption in the problem, the amount that it grew in interest. So what do I get if I take this value, $17,855.92, and I subtract off the original $7,500? Does that make sense? You can look at it with the first uh, formula. Can't get it with the first formula. Why not? Because of the R. It's not because of R. What was the first first formula for interest that we had? Oops. Simple interest. It was simple interest. Yeah, that's the difference. So yeah, we can't use the simple interest formula for a compound interest problem, even if we're still looking for interest. That's the difference. Yeah. Now, if you get it, I will tell you, Alice, you'll get a value that's close, but it won't be exact. Okay? Good question. All right. What do we have next? Oh, all right. Where it says, this one says, find the present value for a future amount. <clears throat> all right. So this is kind of like looking backwards. This is like you went to the bank today, and you found out that your account had in it $9,860. And what you wanted to know is you wanted to know when your parents started the account 10 years ago and then didn't touch it, how much money did they put in 10 years ago? Now, this is the same problem. Uh, it's about, sorry, I should say this is the same formula that we had just a moment ago because what do you see here? You see the word compounded in particular, right? That word compounded means we're using the compound interest formula. There, there really aren't any tricks. Compounded means it's the compound interest formula and simple means it's the simple interest formulas. So if you see the word compounded anywhere in there, that's the formula you're going to be going towards. So the compound interest formula starts out looking like this. And so what are we going to be looking for, Alice? Principal. The principal. So the P here, this principal is the same thing as present value. How nice that they're both P's. Wasn't that friendly? I did that just for you. Not really, but I'll take credit. So this right here, Present value means the same thing as principal. I have no idea if that's the right principal even, so we're just going to write it and pretend. Right. Okay, so A is the amount that you have after however much time. And what is A in this particular problem? That's the 9860. It's the final amount. The P, the amount that you don't know, the present value or the principal, is still P because that's what I'm trying to find. And then the rest of the pieces I have to fill in. Well, 1 plus that part's okay. What's R? 0.08, because that's my interest rate, right? What's N? 4, because it said compounded quarterly. Got 4 up there in the interest rate. And what's T? 10 for 10 years, right? All right, so here's 9860. You're going to do a little bit of algebra. I know some of you don't like algebra so much, but this isn't a lot of algebra. It's just a little bit, okay? Just a little bit. You're going to grab your calculator, and you're going to add the part that's inside the parentheses. Again, this one's not going to be a repeating or ugly decimal. It's going to be nice and clean. 
what is 0.08 divided by 4 and then add the 1? What is that? 1.02. Oops, I wrote it wrong. Sorry. There we go. 1.02. Thank you. And what is the 4 times 10? That's 40. All right. Everybody good so far? Okay, now no matter what kind of calculator you're doing, you're going to work with this part right here. You're going to take that 1.02 and you're going to raise it to the power 40. And it's going to kick you back an answer that's probably going to have a lot of decimals, and you're going to write down a bunch of them. Okay, I mean like at least six or seven. I mean, you're going to write down a bunch of them for now. Do not round early. You will lose track of something and you will have an error. Okay, so I've still got my 9860 on the left. I've still got my P on the right. And now I've got this ugly expression that's going to be one point something, probably. Is it? It's two point something. Okay, it's not too much bigger. Two point something. It's got some lot of decimals. So can you give me, let's say, seven of the decimals, Mackenzie? All right. Um, two, zero, eight, zero, three, nine. Okay, hang on just a second. Was it two point two zero? Oh, yes. Okay. Sorry. Two, zero, eight, zero. What's next? Three, nine, six. All right. That's good for now. All right. You need quite a few of them, okay? Now, some of your calculators have a way of storing the value so it's more exact, but if you've got at least six or seven decimal points written down and you used that rounded value, it's not going to affect the final rounding you have at the end, okay? Keep a lot of decimals. What am I going to do next? Yeah. This, this is the tiny little bit of algebra I was talking about right here, okay? You have to solve for something with a letter on one side and something else on the other. And you do that with division. So we're going to divide that 2.20 um, 390396 on both sides. And we did that because that actually leaves P all alone on the right, correct? Yes, Matt. Don't feel dumb. What you got? Okay, can somebody answer, Matt? Do you know why are we dividing? Yeah. The parentheses here tell me that we're multiplying these two things together. If there were an addition sign, then we would have subtracted. That's how we know. Yes. So the fact that they're just beside each other, or even if they were beside each other um, and didn't have the parentheses, that still would indicate multiplication. Okay, so I only have P left on the right-hand side. What happened on the left-hand side? This is a dollar amount now. This is the principal. It's the amount my parents put in my account 10 years ago. What do you get? $4,465 and how much, Mason? 50 cents. And 50 cents. Even? Five zero? No, four nine. Okay. All right. Anybody else have that value? Okay. Excellent. So you did the right thing, Mason. You actually rounded to two decimal places, right? Because it's money. Right? So don't think that you get to round off to whole numbers or that you, if you put three or four decimals down for me, I'm going to be like, really? What system are we working in today? Okay, make sure we're talking about money. Change in the U.S., two decimal places. My decimal point's not very dark, but there it is. So we have our two decimal points, and then you round. That's exactly at the point when you actually would round it to two decimal places. Don't round too soon. Okay, any questions on this one? This one's kind of a working backwards a little bit, right? Yeah. Okay, one other formula for today. I think this is our last one. Yeah, well, wait, no, it's not. We've got one more after this. This is effective annual yield. All right, so you guys have seen commercials before because you've watched TV, and I know that because you're living in the United States. That's how I know, okay? All right, so you've seen commercials before. And has you ever, have you ever seen a commercial for a car, right, the car lots? And half the time they're not advertising cars. What are they advertising? Credit. They're advertising their credit, aren't they? All right. Some of them even have names like Easy Credit Auto. The word credit's in the name of the car a lot. All right. It's kind of funny. But one of the things that they talk about advertising is they talk about these words that are called, or these, these phrases, and they say APR and APY. Have you heard that before? Yes? Okay. If you haven't, it's okay. But I want you to understand that the APY is the effective annual yield. This is what you hear when the car people talk about APY. A for annual. P is for percentage, and Y is for yield. Okay, so you can see the Y in there with the Y at the end. This is the yield. What this does is it gives you a way to compare accounts. You can compare accounts at banks. You can compare um, lending options by taking into consideration the interest rate and the compounding. 
Because if one people, one, one company charges you compound interest and it's compounded monthly, it may be a better deal to go with another one that con charges you interest and it's only compounded yearly. Okay? But you have another consideration, and that's the interest rate. All right, so when you're considering the rate and you're considering how they're compounding, you've got two different variables that are affecting your decision. What this does, what we're about to do, is it actually levels the playing field. It gives you a way of comparing the different um, credit options, if you will, or the different investing options, if you're doing it from an investing perspective, by considering both the interest rate and the compounding number of compoundings per year. All right, so here is the formula for this one. So this is y, or you could write APY if you'd like, but it's y equals is what your book is going to use. What does P stand for? Percentage. P stands for percentage, yes, annual percentage yield. <coughs> and you're going to see a piece of this that you've already seen before. Okay, that should look familiar so far, does it? That looks like that compound interest formula, doesn't it? In fact, it's even got another piece of that compound interest formula in it. It even has that exponent of n, but it doesn't have anything to do with the time frame. Okay, so I do not need to consider the t in there. So what do you do next? Well, after you do that, you take off the number 1, and you multiply by 100%. Okay, so this taking off this number 1... What it does in effect is it takes off the initial amount of whatever you were talking about. It takes off the principal. And I know you don't see P listed in here for principal. That's okay. The initial amount that you invest does not affect the decision. The decision would be the same thing no matter how much money you invested or how much money you were borrowing. So that's why it doesn't matter. Same thing for time. It doesn't matter how long you leave it in there for. So if I'm considering a 48-month option over here and a 48-month option over here, it doesn't make any difference because they were the same amount of time that I was talking about. And I'm talking about borrowing the same amount of money or investing the same amount of money. All right, so here's an example. <clears throat> Suppose a bank pays a nominal rate. So we've already introduced a word or a phrase that we haven't talked about. So let me talk about what nominal rate means. Nominal rate is the R that we have been working with in all of our problems. In particular, in my example for my car lot from a moment ago, it's the APR that they talk about from the car lot perspective. So this is the APR. It's the annual percentage rate or the nominal rate. They're just words for the same thing. It's the R in the problem. It's the interest rate. Okay? So that's the R. Their, um, their rate is actually 2% on a savings deposit. So this is like a savings account. It says find the effective annual yield if the interest rate is compounded, and we're going to do some examples. Number four says monthly. So we've got this same formula from above, y equals. Actually, let me put it over here. 1 plus, what is r? 0.02. It's the only number in the problem, isn't it? What is n? Nope. Why is it 12? Yeah, that one right there said monthly, right? So this one's going to be 12. So I have a 12 exponent then too, right? And then I'm going to subtract the number 1. And when it's all said and done, I'm going to multiply by 100. Because that will turn it back into a percentage for me. <coughs> Now, I want you guys to take your calculators and we're going to do the, comp we're going to do the computation together. You're going to do the division step, step first. And what happens when you do this division step? Alexis, what happened? Can you do this, just this, just this piece for me? Do the 0.02 divided by 12. What happened that has not yet happened? This is a repeating decimal, okay? So we've got a repeating decimal for this little piece. Don't round it. You don't need to. Your calculator will handle that repeating decimal just fine. Just leave it there. And then what do I need to do? Add 1. Okay, I know I'm not moving from left to right, but you can do that with addition, right? 1 plus this is the same as this plus 1. It's a commutative property of addition. We're allowed to do that. So you're going to take that repeating ugly decimal. It's kind of ugly because it doesn't stop. And we're going to add 1 to it. So hit then plus 1. Okay, so now you got 1 point whatever the ugly decimal was. It didn't change it. 
Next thing you're going to do is you're going to hit that caret key or that x to the y key on your calculator, and you're going to put in as 12 as an exponent, so to the 12th. And you're going to hit enter again. And now the decimal became something that looks really bad. Because now it doesn't even look repeating, does it? Nope, it doesn't. It's okay. Next thing you're going to do, moving through the formulas, you're going to hit minus 1. You don't have to write any of this down, okay? If you want to write a piece or two of this down, that's okay. That's helpful to me if I'm looking for partial credit to grade. But you don't have to. Your calculator will store each step that you used before. Okay? So did everybody do the minus 1 and hit enter? Awesome. And then hit times 100. Now let me tell you a little bit about what kind of answer you should expect to see. You should expect to see an answer that's very close to the initial rate you started with. The initial rate was 2%. So your answer better be close to 2%. Also, it better be slightly higher than 2%. Okay? What answer do you get for this? 2.0184. Okay? And it had more decimals than that, didn't it? Yeah. Lots of decimals. So the question then is, well, how many do I want? I want two decimals on all your answers. Okay? Just like the money. It's the easiest way for us to handle that. So what would this be? 2.0184. 0.2%. Okay, so why did that happen? Because, I mean, it started with 2%, and all of a sudden now at the end, my answer is I've got a 2.02%. What is this effective yield business doing? Well, what it's doing is it's creating interest upon interest. Okay? This is what happens when you put your money into an account that has interest. It's also what happens when you borrow money and have to pay interest to pay a loan back. So I don't know um, how much experience you guys have with loans or with putting money into accounts, but I will tell you the first earth-shattering discovery for mine was the first house we bought. We bought a $100,000 house, and when we were at closing, they showed us this sheet, and we're going to talk more about home loans later. They showed us this sheet, and at the very end of the sheet, it showed us how much money we would end up eventually paying for that $100,000 house if we paid it out as it was expected us to pay out. And do you want to know how much money we would have ended up paying out for that $100,000 house? almost $300,000. We didn't stay in the house. That's not why, but we didn't, okay? So the amount of interest upon interest accumulates more and more as you go. Now, it works the other way when you're doing a loan. You pay the majority of the interest at the front and you start accruing less as you go. But well, that's what happens when you put your money in the account as well. So this particular one was Pioneer Savings Deposit. Same thing. You put your money in the account and you leave it there and you don't touch it. And what happens is the first month or the first time they compound interest, they compound it on your 500 bucks. But the second time that they compound interest, they compound on your $500.50 or whatever. So there's slightly more interest the second time because there's slightly more money in the account the second time. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's what's happening when you're doing this is you're actually talking about the interest on the interest. And effective yield is a way to compare that. Okay. So when people are talking about the APY or the effective yield, they're talking about the actual real rate that you end up paying when you consider paying interest upon interest, either in the loan or in them giving you the money on your account for what you're saving with them. If everybody's okay, say yes. Okay. All right, there's one more formula. <coughs> All right, so this one is continually compounded interest. Um, there's a typo on their screen there, sorry. This should say interest is compounded, not I compounded. Interest is compounded at a continuous rate as opposed to monthly, annually, etc. There are applications for this um, that are legit. Putting them in a savings account at the bank is not a very good application because they don't compound this way at banks. But it gives us a place to start. This formula you've probably also seen before. Whoops. It's P equals, sorry, P equals A equals P. Okay, so that looks familiar, right? You have seen that formula before. The next part's the part that you haven't seen. You have an E. Well, that's a new letter. We haven't worked with that one yet. And you have an exponent that is RT as opposed to NT. Right, so Matt, you were the one who asked me the question on that previous slide that says, was that an N or an R in the exponent? It was an N in the other formula. It's an R in this formula. So we have RT as our exponent. 
And the only thing new here is the letter E. Everything else is the same as before. Now here's the cool thing. E is actually not a variable. It's not a letter. I, I know it looks like a letter, but it's not. I promise. Okay? E is a numerical value, and it is an irrational number. You've seen irrational numbers before. We've actually talked about them before, too. Give me an example of an irrational number. That's... Nope. Pi. Pi. Pi is the one that's most related to E. Right? You guys know pi. You know it's not 3.14, right? We use that as an approximation, but that's not really what it is. And if you want to compute something accurately with pi, how do you do it? Well, using it in a formula, how would you do it to the best you could? Would you use 3.14? No. You would not use 3.14. No, E has nothing to do with pi. <laughs> Not in this context right here. Oh. In the calculator, right? right? Yeah, yeah. So the best you can do to use pi in a formula is to do it with a calculator that uses a really long decimal expansion. Again, it's not perfect, right? But if it gives you enough decimal expansion to be accurate to the decimals you want, that's what you're looking for. We're going to be using the E in your calculator as well. So look around and see if you can find it. I will tell you first then that E is a number, contrary to what you thought when you walked into the classroom today, and it is approximately 2.718. Again, just like the number pi is not 3.14, it is not 2.718. That is an approximation for it. But you're going to use the value in your calculator. Okay. The A, the P, the R, the T, everything else is exactly like we've defined them before. Nothing any different. <clears throat> oh, I guess I should have put this down here where I had more space. That's what happens when you're not looking carefully. All right, and the E business was supposed to have been written down here. All right, my slide doesn't look very good, but you got the right idea. Everybody's got it in their notes anyway, yeah? That's the important part. Okay, so we're going to do one example of this, and then we'll pause here today. All right, so one example says, oops. No, we're not. We're going we're gonna to do one more example. Find the present value for the future amount. Now, we saw that direction before. What does that mean? We need to find the principal. We need to find P, right? Okay. So it says use the data from problem number two. Okay, so you guys had problem number two. It was way earlier. One page earlier, we had this chart, right? We're using this chart's information, and we're going to find <coughs> the present value for the future amount. So that sounds kind of funny, but we're going to use the future amount that we got for our answer. So what was our future amount? What was our A when we did problem number two? What did we come up with? 17, 8, 55, 92. That was the future value or the future amount that we had. So we're going to take this problem with that amount and we're going to work our way backwards to find the P and see how differently the P would have been if it were compounded continuously instead of semi-annually. Okay? All right, so the formula that we're going to use is the A equals P E to the RT. And the A value is what we know from that previous problem. So that's the 17,855.92. P is what we're finding. What's that? Are you okay? Yep. Okay. Um, e is a number, so we don't put anything in for it. We just write E. R is an interest rate. What is R? Point oh what? In problem number two, what was R? It was three five in problem number two. It's okay. And what was the time from problem number two? Twenty five. So that's staying the same as twenty five years. All right. So again, you need to be careful with your calculator. There is multiplication going on in this exponent. So that's the first thing I want you to do. Take your calculator. I want you to multiply point oh three five times twenty five. And what do you get? 0 0.875. Thank you. What are we going to do next? Yes. You 
should have an E in your calculator. If you don't, or if you're not sure where it is, make sure and ask me before you leave class today. This piece right here, you're going to do it next. This is an E with an exponent of 0.875. So you take your calculator, you put the button, it's got E in it, and you do the exponent key. If it didn't already pull it up automatically for you, it will in the one that you're working with, some of you. Um, and then you put the 0.875. Somebody's going to tell me real quickly what you get. Okay, maybe not that quickly. Let's go with seven. Two eights? Okay, eight, seven, five, two. Thank you. All right, so we kept to this point in a moment ago. What do we do next? Right. We will divide the 17,000 on the other side by this. 2.39. Eight eight seven five two. And when we divide this, we will find the principal or the present value. Again, it's going to be close to that seventy five hundred the original problem started with, but it will not be seventy five hundred. It should be slightly less. So four six. Is it close to seventy five hundred? Yes, but it's slightly less. And why is it slightly less? Well, because it's compounding more frequently. It's compounding all the time instead of semi annually. So we have a little bit less that we would have had to originally put in the account for it to actually end up with the same amount in ten in twenty five years. All right.